dealing with osteoarthritis pain in both my ankles and was wondering, um, wondering with going gluten-free and diet change, have you seen osteoarthritis reverse? Is it possible to rebuild cartilage? Yes. And depending on the extent of the damage, if you, a lot of times when I, when I hear orthopedists give a patient, they, they tell them, you've got bone on bone. That's not 100% true. Most people don't have bone on bone. It's pretty rare. You've got to be pretty decrepit, pretty injured to have bone on bone. And so most cases of osteoarthritis are really nothing more than advanced cases of lack of movement that can be reversed with adequate movement and mobility training. Okay. Can you get iodine from going in the ocean every day? I don't know that anybody's ever studied iodine absorption through the skin, so I don't, I don't know that, I don't know the answer. That's a great question. I've not, I've not seen any research that we could say that's been adequately studied to say yes or no. Uh, gargling your throat with salt water is probably not going to lead to much iodine uh, in terms of, of adequacy for you. Is iodine, is, I'm wondering if iodine is good for women with fibroids and cystic breasts. You know, I've seen, I've seen it do wonders for women with fibroids and cystic breast tissue issues, Angie. So um, again, simple thing, if you want to understand where you're at with iodine, um, get it measured. There's, there's different ways to measure it, but you can do iodine in the blood. I, my favorite way to measure it is what's called a loading test. And so a loading test, and it's the most accurate way to do it, is to, it's a urine collection, but before you take your urine, you take 50 milligrams of iodine, and that's typically a Lugol solution, and um, 50 milligrams, and then you collect urine for 24 hours. And what you're actually looking for on that follow-up test is you're looking for a person to excrete or get rid of or pee out 40 plus milligrams of the iodine bolus. So that's how much should come out in the urine over 24 hour period of time after loading with that quantity of iodine. And if you see this coming out, then that person's tissues are adequately saturated with iodine and their body is getting rid of the excess. If you, if you see less than this, less than 40, then you, you definitely have an issue with iodine saturation in your tissues, predominantly your breast tissue and your thyroid tissue. Um, how many drops of Lugol solution is it safe to take? Depends on, on what's, um, what the dosing is for what you've got, the preparation that you've got. But again, generally speaking, it's very safe. You keep your iodine levels 12.5 milligrams a day and less. It's very safe. You don't really have much to worry about in terms of side effects or toxicity. Um, you know, the, the, there are cultures across the world that eat that much in their diet because the seafood diet is so heavy. Um, you, you, know, you know, Americans, most Americans don't come anywhere near close to that. Now, should you take cofactors with higher doses of iodine, i.e. riboflavin, selenium? Well, there's some research studies, Lane, that show that, um, it's a great question, that selenium, zinc, vitamin A, and iron. So these are, these are nutrients, minerals that um, are very important and synergistically help with the efficiency of iodine. And so the answer to that question, in my opinion, is yes. You should, you should make sure that you're not deficient in these nutrients. More specifically, I, I kind of bungled that word. That, that reads vitamin A. Um, selenium, zinc, vitamin A, and iron help your iodine work more efficiently. And so knowing what your status is of these nutrients as well is important because if you're, for example, if your vitamin A levels are low, 
right? And you're driving up your iodine to produce more T3. T3, in order to talk to your cell, because that's what happens inside your cell, you have what are called nuclear receptors on the, on the um, nuclear receptors on the cell nucleus, and those receptors are basically, they, they're vitamin A receptors or retinoic acid receptors, and so vitamin A and T3 combine to, to, to form what's called a dimer, and they unlock the cell itself, and then that's what increases your metabolic function. So if you're taking a bunch of iodine but don't have adequate vitamin A, that mechanism, that final mechanism of increase in metabolism can be hindered. So again, that's just an example. Uh, but yes, cofactors with the iodine are important. Again, that's why we don't look at, you know, we're talking about tonight iodine in it kind of almost like in its own little bubble. But nutrients never work in a bubble. It's, they're, they're synergistic with the other nutrients. And so that's why most foods, you don't eat one food that only contains one nutrient. Foods generally contain multitudes of hundreds of nutrients, thousands of nutrients, if we call, consider the phytonutrients and even the unknowns. But um, they work together, they work synergistically. So it's, it's always best to try to get as much adequacy within your food. But the problem is, again, if you live in an area or region where there's not iodine adequacy, and we also have to consider the soil and the way that food is farmed today, the soil is vastly depleted. The nutritional adequacy of the food that we are making and producing in the soil today is inferior to what it was 30, 40, 50 years ago, by far, at least by half, and in some cases by more. So you know, this is where supplementation comes in and can be very helpful. Is sea salt fortified with the same as traditional salt with iodine? No, it's not. Um, is iodine safe for those with Hashimoto's? It's a great question. A lot of people ask that. Yes. There are, um, I've seen those, those, some of those internet kind of reports where, you know, where, where some people are out there saying, if you have Hashimoto's, you should never use iodine. And that's not true. In some cases, Hashimoto's is actually exacerbated by iodine deficiency. Now, what you shouldn't do if you have Hashimoto's is you shouldn't be mega dosing iodine. You shouldn't be taking 50 milligrams a day of iodine on your own without having that properly monitored. But my, my advice, if you've got Hashimoto's, you've got TSH, we talked about this a minute ago, T3, T4, you've got something called reverse T3. Okay, these are kind of the primary hormones that can be measured around thyroid. And then you have TPO, which is thyroid peroxidase, and then you have antithyroglobulin antibodies which is another test and so these are these are the antibody tests that help the doctor understand where your Hashimoto's is is, it, is your are your antibody levels going up or are they going down and so um, what a lot of times happens when you take when you take iodine so if you're taking higher doses of iodine let's just say you're taking 25 12 to 25 milligrams of iodine when you follow up with your doctor what happens is that iodine that you're taking increases your TSH. And I've seen it increase TSH into the 20s. So let's just say you are on iodine, you, you, your TSH goes up to 25 when you go to your doctor. Now, no, the range of TSH is 0.5 to 4.5 on most labs. So here you are taking iodine, you, you drive up your TSH into the 20s, your doctor's freaking out, right, because your TSH is so high. And, we understand that when TSH is high, they think your thyroid is low. That's the, that's the mechanism. And so they're freaking out and they're saying, oh my gosh, you should never have taken that iodine. It's caused your thyroid to malfunction. And the reality is this is an artificial read. It doesn't really affect how your thyroid functions in a negative way, but it does artificially drive up your TSH. Biotin does the same thing. So biotin is a B vitamin, right? It's sometimes referred to as B7 and sometimes referred to as B8. But So biotin and iodine, higher doses of these can both drive up your TSH. So again, if you've got an untrained doctor that doesn't know much about nutrition, they're freaking out and they're scaring the heck out of you, telling you to get off that toxic iodine because it's destroying your thyroid function. Nothing could be further from the truth. Iodine does not really have any impact on TPO or antithyroglobulin antibodies. So it doesn't really drive that. What happens to some people is they megadose iodine and they're at 50 plus 
milligrams a day and it can drive you into hyperthyroidism and this is rare but it can happen and there's a condition called Graves Graves disease and so this is a hyperthyroid state and so there are cases and reports where mega dosing of high levels of iodine over time can do this but this is why if you're going to do higher doses you should be having it monitored and measured. Don't just go high doses forever indefinitely. That would be a mistake. But there's no danger in taking iodine for people with Hashimoto's. Um, let's see here. Some functional doctors say iodine can worsen Hashimoto's or underactive thyroid. I think I just answered that. It was in there twice. Um, so if you take a drop of iodine, 640 micrograms, I mean, depending on what kind of iodine it is, it's not much. 640 is a pretty small amount. My biggest problem is high reverse T3. What could this, what could be causing this? Lots of things. So, so T4 converts to T3 or it converts to reverse T3 if you don't have enough selenium. So selenium runs an enzyme called diiodinase that, that converts T4 to T3. And it, like I said, if you don't have enough, if your selenium is low, your body will make reverse T3 instead. And it's, and so your reverse T3 will be driven up. Now this, this can also happen if your thyroid medicine is too strong. So if you're taking too much thyroid, I see this a lot in people that... Um, their doctors are, are giving them thyroid medicine not based on their lab, but based on their symptoms. So like you go in, you got brain fog, and your doctor says, well, let's just give you more thyroid. It's a mistake, in my opinion, um, because then they end up over-medicating people, and when you over-medicate them, their body's natural defense is to convert that medicine into reverse T3, because reverse T3 is inactive. It doesn't work. So it's one of your body's mechanisms of defense to protect you from an overdose. So if you're on meds, if your thyroid meds are too strong, and generally speaking, I get this a lot too. Remember, your TSH should be between 0.5 and 4.5, but a lot of times somebody will get their TSH back and they're like 0 0.04 dot, 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 right? So like they're so low, they're 10 times lower the, on their TSH than normal, which means they're being very well over medicated to, to, the, to the level of hyperthyroidism, which can cause heart palpitations, hair loss, hot flashes, anxiety, trouble sleeping, a lot of those types of symptoms. So if you're on medicine and, and those are all happening to you, you des definitely want to talk to your doctor about, um, about getting all those things measured. In, when testing for T4 and T3, isn't it the free test that needs to be drawn both? So you want total T4 and you want free T4. I just, you know, I didn't go into that because I didn't want to bore people with the nuance of it. but. It's both. It's free and total that you want to measure, Ravi. I take kelp supplements. How much should I take and is it a good source? So it depends on the kelp um, and depends on the dose. What is it standardized to have as far as iodine is concerned? That would be the question. Are cherry angiomas caused from bromine toxicity and can iodine help reduce or eliminate these spots? Um, my experience, more cherry angiomas are caused by estrogen dominance or est estrogen being too high. So um, not so much bromine, but I'm glad you mentioned bromine because we didn't really talk about, about a couple of things that relate to iodine. And one is bromine. So these three are referred to as halides. Um, halides are, and, and iodine's a halide too. They're, they're, they're substances within the same family of compounds. And so what happens is halides all compete. They, they're so similar in their properties that they compete for binding or uptake into your thyroid gland. So if your bromine levels are too high or your fluoride's too high or you're getting too much chlorine exposure, it will push out basically or compete with iodine and can create iodine deficit, can create deficiency. And so a lot of this is why it's important too to test bromine, fluoride, and chlorine uh, toxicity 
uh, or evaluate for it because sometimes you can be low in iodine and the reason is one of these things and not necessarily because you're not eating enough iodine. But where does bromine come from? It's, um, it's a flame retardant. It's sprayed on fabrics, it's sprayed on, on carpets and, and other things. It's also, bromine is used in soda. It's used in certain meds. Bromine is also in bread. It's, it's actually, if you've ever seen the term brominated flour, it's, they use bromine um, to condition the dough in flour. And so a lot of times when you buy a bag of flour, if you're not gluten-free, you get brominated. You get bromine in the flour. Fluoride, toothpaste, mouthwash, tea is a common source of heavy fluoride exposure. Those are probably the biggest ones outside of drinking water and, and water fluoride fortification, just depending on where you live. And of course, chlorine's in your drinking water. And if you're using good carbon filtration, you'll, you'll filter chlorine out. But chlorine is also in a lot of antibiotics and pesticides. Remember that bromine fluoride and chlorine are toxic generally in higher amounts and so they are used in pesticides and so if you have your house sprayed with a lot of these different types of chemicals you can also get exposure but um, it's, it's smart if you have an iodine deficiency to also check your other halides to make sure you don't have a toxicity of those driving your iodine down uh, my doctor only measures tsh i have asked her um, she said it's not necessary. She said it's not necessary because she doesn't know what it means, most likely. I mean, I don't want to put words in her mouth or demeanor, but it is necessary. Uh, you know, if you want a comprehensive evaluation of your health, it's necessary to look at the things involved around your thyroid. And TSH, I don't know, it's, it's such an overly simplistic view of such a complex organ system connected to other endocrine organs. And so to, to demean it and diminish it by only monitoring TSH, um, either that doctor doesn't know these other things or they're, they're lazy and they just don't want to mess with it and answer your questions, um, you know, or they're just, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to put, I don't want to put intention uh, where, where it, it doesn't belong, but I just can't imagine a doctor who's trained adequately not wanting to measure more than just TSH and, and, in an effort to want to be thorough. Um, otherwise, again, they're just lazy. They just don't care. They don't, you know, they're, not, they're, in, they're in healthcare for the wrong reason, and that happens. It happens in every profession. Not everybody who um, is a doctor is like an awesome doctor who should be a doctor that have empathy and they love their patients. A lot of them are just in it for the paycheck because, you know, along the way, somebody told them doctors make good money. That's just the reality of it. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.